Hello again, everybody. We have a new screencast lecture. Today's topic is how are living things classified. Let's begin. Think about going to the grocery store and your parent tells you to go find a box of Frosted Flakes. Where are you going to go? Well, you're just going to wander up and down each aisle. That's one way to do it. Probably not the most efficient. Think about the way that stores organize the items that are in their, that they offer for sale. So cereal would be in the cereal aisle. Pasta would be in the pasta aisle, and soups, and canned foods, and vegetables, things like that. They all have their own aisle, different sections that you can find all of the similar things. If you look at this picture, you can see all the different kinds of cereal here. All the kids' cereal, by the way, when you go to the grocery store, check this out. All the kids' cereals, all the sugary sweet stuff, that's going to be near the bottom, so the kids can see it, and they can grab it and bug their parents about it. And then up here at the top of the shelves, that's going to be where all kind of the more boring adult food is, the granola, things like that. Check that out the next time you go to see the grocery store. Why don't grocery stores organize their food items alphabetically? Wouldn't that be an easy way to do it? Well, think about what that would look like. So you'd have bread next to butter and things like that, which makes some sense. But then you could also have breads and beans together, since they both start with B. doesn't make nearly as much sense. Especially when you think about items that would have to be put in a refrigerator. You're going to want those items together, and items in, free, in the freezer, you're going to want to have those together, things like that. Think about libraries. Library books are organized in what way? Well, they are organized by what they are like, their subject matter. So history books are going to be together with history books. Mystery books are going to be together with mystery books. You are not going to organize books in the library, again, by, alf by alphabet. One area where you will kind of have alphabetical, though, which is interesting, if you go to the fiction section, the books are going to be organized alphabetically, but not by title. They're going to be alphabet uh, organized alphabetically by the author's last name. Let's talk about Aristotle. Aristotle, you probably have heard of in your social studies class. Aristotle is probably one of the, if not the most famous, of the Greek philosophers. The three big Greek philosophers that you probably have learned about would be Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Aristotle lived over 2,000 years ago, and he is famous for doing a whole lot of things. One of the things he's famous for is being one of the first people to make an organization system for organisms and he grouped organisms into two different groups living thing of living things they would be plants and animals in a lot of ways we still do this today we organize things in plants and animals there's a whole bunch of other things we do too in this day this was a pretty good way to organize things he also then went on to organize the plants in particular as useful and non-useful. So if you think about useful plants, that could be things like corn, bean, tomatoes, potatoes, things that you would find useful like to eat for food or maybe certain trees you could use to build houses, things like that. Non-useful plants might be something like poison ivy where you're not, not going to want to have weeds, things like that that are not any use to you at all. Plants and animals was a very useful way that people could organize things in Aristotle's time. Many years after that, almost another 2,000 years, another fellow came around, along. His name was Linnaeus, Carolus and Linnaeus. He was in the 1700s. Here's a uh, contemporary painting of him. He developed a system of organizing organisms that were based on similar characteristics or similar structures. Here you see some of his drawings and you may have noticed that some of these different species might have things in common like you would find oh these this flower has red flowers this has red flowers. Different plants might have uh, different types of flowers. Different trees might have, some might have blossoms. Those would be flowers that come on trees. Some of them would not have that. Some of the trees would have leaves that were shaped in similar ways. Like if you think about maple trees, they have a very similar shape to their leaf. Or oak, tr oak leaves, they have similar shapes. Different types of oak would have uh, different types of, of seeds, things like that. Acorns, da 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 da. So there's a whole lot of different similar characteristics of different species of organisms, plants included. I have mentioned this in the past, but scientists back in the olden days, like these old-timey scientists, often they were very, very good artists. And the reason why is they did not have access to photography like we do today. So if they wanted to write down, uh, have a picture of what the species would look like, they would have to make very, very detailed drawings. And a lot of these guys were very good artists. I mean, this is a whole lot better than I could draw. Organisms today are classified by their physical structure, how they look. This is probably the one that makes the most sense to you and I. So if, again, we mentioned things like if they have flowers or not, uh, different 
types of seeds or not, different types of leaves. Those are all similar uh, physical characteristics. They might have roots that grow underground that you can eat, like potatoes and carrots. They have potatoes, potatoes, tomatoes. Uh, another one would be genetic similarities. For example, they might have the same number of chromosomes. Chromosomes we probably don't know a whole lot about right now. You're going to learn a whole lot more about these in eighth grade, but let's think about this as in terms of its genetic code, its genetic information, the directions that your cells have to make new cells. So your your genes, your chromosomes might tell you, you will make blue eyes, or your genes might say, you have brown eyes, and you have blonde hair, you have red hair. Your your chromosomes, your genes are going to tell your 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 cells what to do. It'll be the directions or the instructions on how to make cells for your body. Different organisms will often have different numbers of chromosomes. Here you see humans. Humans have 46 total chromosomes. That'd be 23 chromosome pair. Mouse has 40 total, so 20 chromosome pair. A fruit fly has only four chromosome pairs. Go all the way down to bacteria, a very, very simple organism. It's a prokaryotic cell. It doesn't have all of the uh, advanced cell structures like uh, membrane organelles like we would have on other in our cells and things like that. A bacteria has only one chromosome. And a third way that organisms are classified would be their evolutionary history. What this means is how the species has changed over time. Some species would be re more closely related and have uh, common ancestors for their species, and you can group them in that way as well. So if you like, for example, you look at this chart, there would be a the sharks, which have been around for a very, very long time. They would be different and organized differently than the mammals. And the mammals and lizards would have a more common, more recent ancestor than, say, sharks. They would be much further away. SpongeBob has this going on too. So here's like the evolutionary history of different SpongeBob characters. And you might be kind of surprised to know that there is a lot of accuracy in the show, in the SpongeBob show. I mean, you kind of have to look for it, and all the things, of course, are not true. I mean, you don't have sponges walking around talking, etc. However, there are, it was developed originally by a marine biologist, and there's some pretty neat stuff in there if you know what to look for. Let's go back to Linnaeus' system. Here are seven different organisms. A brown bear, a black bear, a panda, a fox, a squirrel, a snake, and a sea star. They all have something in common. They're all what's part of the animal kingdom. And animals are classified as are classified as organisms that are multicellular. That means they're made up of at least two or more cells. They are heterotrophs, and you should know what that means. That means that they are not autotrophs. That means that they cannot produce their own energy-rich molecules, so they need to consume other organisms. And they are able to move independently. Grouping would be the phylum, and this group is going to be the phylum Chordata. And you notice that the sea star is left out, so the sea star is no longer part of this group. This group has a spinal cord, has a spinal nervous system on, in their back. So animals with a back nerve cord. Next would be Mammalia, and that's why Mr. Snake here gets excluded, because the snake is not a mammal, and you probably know a little bit about what mammals are. These these five are still mammals. Mammals have hair, they can produce milk for their young, and they have a brain that regulates their body temperature. And you remember that that is a form of homeostasis to be able to monitor their own body temperature. Snakes need to sun themselves in the on a hot rock during the day to keep their body temperatures up. They're not able to do that like we are. Next group knocks out Mr. Squirrel because this is the order Carnivora, and you probably recognize the word carnivorous in there and a carnivora can refer to any meat-eating organism it can be omnivorous like raccoons and bears and this interestingly enough is where us as humans get knocked out up until this point humans would be this we're animals we're chordatas we're, we're chordates we are mammals and however here we would be, go branch off to another group that's called the primates and that primates would include guys like the apes the chimpanzees bonobos Folks like that. Here we have the order Carnivora, which is, in this case, the brown bear, the black bear, the panda, and the fox. Next one knocks out Mr. Fox. This are, is the family Ursidae, and Ursidae include the modern bears. They have large bodies, they have shaggy hair, they have short tails. Fox, not so much. Smaller body, long tail. 
Eight species are included. They include the polar bear, pandas, brown bears, a whole bunch of other bears. And then let's go down to the genus. This is the genus Ursus. And the genus Ursus comes from the Latin word Ursa. Like you may have heard of the constellation Ursa Major. That is the big bear constellation. The species that are in genus Ursus would include the polar bear, the brown bear, and the black bear. There is actually also an Asian bear. A lot of you, I mean, I, I don't know much about it. Most of you probably don't know much about it either. Here is a picture of Ursa Major, and you probably recognize this part right here. That asterism is the Big Dipper. Hopefully you got that. So the Big Dipper is actually part of a constellation called Ursa Major, and Ursa Major is for the Big Bear. Ursa being bear, Major being big. Big bear. So that's where we're at right now. We're at Genus, which has the polar bears, the brown bears, the black bears, and then finally we have this guy. We can separate them down to the brown bear. How is the brown bear different than the black bear and the polar bear? Well, the brown bear is brown, and the black bear is black, and the polar bear is white. And so we have Ursus Arctos, which stands for brown bear. Which of these groups, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, which is the largest, the least specific, the most general of the groups? Well, of course, that would be the kingdom. There's a whole bunch more kingdom uh, organisms than there are species. There's only one species in the species. The most specific, of course, then would be the species where there's one of them versus thousands of different animals, species. Linnaeus' system of classification has six kingdoms, and then it gets broken down to phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. You're going to need to, to know these different classification subgroups. And one way that I like to remember to do this is to take the first letter of kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and I made a sentence out of it. And you, I strongly encourage you to come up with your own sentence. Please do so. Bring, come up with a sentence, bring it to school, share it with your classmates. We'll talk about ones and see if we can get a good one. I'd love to get a much better one than I have. Mine's pretty lame, but it's worked for me for many, many years. Here's mine. It's Kings Play Cards on Friday Going South. I don't know why, but it works for me. And that's how I remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Make up your own. Oh, you can even look at you can even look at the uh, internet. Maybe there's a decent one on the internet. Binomial nomenclature is our next topic here. And if you look at the words binomial nomenclature, you might know some of these different prefixes and suffixes. Bi meaning two, and nom is name. So the, this is a two-word naming system. The scientific names have two words in them. So the first word is going to be the genus. So it's a group of similar species. So if you have all these, these guys over here, they're all the same genus. They are different species. They all have something in common. They are all dog-like. And that's where the genus canis comes from. So you probably have heard of the Latin word canine. That's where canine comes from. It's from the Latin word can, canis. Like uh, the canine unit is part of the genus Canis. And how it's different, this is gray, and so they called it the Canis lupus. Lupus is for gray, so this is the gray wolf. The If you think of lupus, you would also think of, could possibly think of Harry Potter. So if you think of the one character, I believe his name was Lup, Lup, Lupine, I think. And what was it? Luke, Lucas? No, it was like L Lupin. Lupin, that was it. Lupin, and he was one of the guys who, when he would change into an animal, he would change into a wolf. And if you also think of Sirius Black, uh, a lot of the characters in Sirius Black had glasses? I don't remember. But he uh, he turned into a dog, if you recall, and I think he even turned into a black dog, if I'm not mistaken. So in the, in the Harry Potter, Potter book, there's actually a lot of hints on what these guys were based on their names, if you know some Latin. This also works for other types of organisms like trees. Maple trees, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of maple trees. They have some differences. They're different species. And if we would like to figure out what species this is, how they're different from these, share the same genus, and that genus is called Acer. All the maple trees would be in the genus Acer. The Latin word for red is rubrum, so the red maple tree that looks like this is going to be called the Acer rubrum, the red maple. Let's take a look at this chart. You can see kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. The Latin word for cat is felix, and you can see like feline. That's where you, you know the word feline. So those are your kitty cats. And we talked about Canis meaning dog, so there's your dogs. The Canis familiaris, that would be your house dog, your familiar dog. 
and the uh, Ursus we mentioned, Latin word for bear. Well, that's all we got for tonight, folks. Hope you enjoyed it. Do you want to come say goodnight? You don't want to say goodbye? Okay, well, we'll have to do it for you. Be careful, kids. Bye. All right, see you next time. Toodles. Then how do you do it? Be careful, kids. Bye. Bye.